five million light years he can put on a display. Right. And so, of course, they worship him. And he is actually, they say, the, the maintainer of the universe. He's like the Vishnu of, of, of the angels, keeping us all here. And they have some secret books which scholars have found and helped translate. A French guy translated them into French, in fact. Um, I've not been able to find those texts yet. I've been looking. Um, they're quite hold, hard to get hold of. But I vaguely know what's in them, and that's what I've told you the story, right? Um, <clears throat> the Muslims don't like this at all. And so when the extreme Muslims took power in Syria and they were running around ISIS types um, with support from stupid people who thought, you know, let's create a meltdown inside Islam, they went after the Yazidis and called them devil worshippers. And they wanted to kill them all. And a few years ago, when I was living in Scotland, um, they chased them out of the villages and they were all on a mountain, freezing to death. Men, women and children. There's only a few tens of thousands of Yazidis in the whole Middle East. You know, there's not that many. Um, well, it says there's 800,000. Maybe there's more than I thought, but that's not a lot scattered all over these different countries. And many of them were killed. When these fanatical Muslims captured them, they, could, they thought they could kill the men and rape the women, keep them as sex slaves. I've... I've seen pictures on YouTube and discussions of these poor women who have escaped telling what horrendous things happened to them just because they have a different theology. I think we should respect them, love them. They're really interesting and study them. You know, what are their stories? Um, and maybe they're right. Maybe their version of the story is the correct one. You know, how do we know that the Quran is... 100% true. It was written only in 600 AD. Do these Yazidi scriptures, are they older? Let's find out. And do what um, Anakan Vada tells us. Let's suspend judgment. Like good Jain uh, Odin followers and runics. And just find the truth. So, and that's why I fight for peace. Because I want peace in the Middle East. So the Yazidis can live in peace. You know. There's quite a few of them also in Turkey and in Iraq and in Iran. Let them flourish. And they love clothes. They're very colourful people. The men have big hats and, you know, they like dancing. They're great people. And some of them now live in Europe. They've escaped as refugees. There's probably a bunch in Paris. And um, if they want to come and visit the Peace Museum here, they're welcome. Okay, that's the Yazidis. <coughs> How does that fit with Kant? You might say, well, nothing at all. Kant's just Kant. No, there's a, there's a connection, right? So Kant was a great German philosopher in Konigsberg on the uh, Baltic Sea who, who wanted to know absolute truth. He dedicated his life to philosophical research. He was the most disciplined of all philosophers, I think, probably of all of them. Um... He spent all his time reading and writing and thinking, walking around Konigsberg um, with his head, you know, deeply in. The questions he was asking is, what is truth? How can we know? What is goodness? What is moral goodness? How, you know, how can we know the difference between right and wrong? Is there something in me that always knows the difference? And where is it? Um... What's the best society to have? Like, should it be a monarchy or a democracy or what? You know, what's, what form of society will best guarantee stability and peace? And he also asked, what form of international relations will best form a peaceful world? How can we get peace between all the nations? These are all really important questions. Um, he also asked, is, is the God of the Bible true? Is how can we know? Is the God of Christianity true? How do we know? You know. Um, okay, so what he found is that wherever you start from in your intellectual journey, you're going to hit a point beyond which your mind can't go. You're going to end up in what he called antinomies, which are opposite statements that are both plausible. 
So let's go back to the thing. Is the God of the Bible true? Is, is that, does that God exist or not? Right. Now, I can read the Bible. I've read the whole thing, you know. Um, Kant did as well. It's, it's possible that that God actually exists. The God of the Bible, Yahweh, you know. It's also possible that God doesn't exist. And that those scriptures are written by slightly fanatical people to justify their geopolitical ambitions to set up little kingdoms and, you know, be the powerful peacock strutting around. And, and, and a critical student of the Bible has written a book called How Many, God, How Many People Did God Slay in the Bible? Question mark. And he's, he's counted them all up. It's nearly three million are known to have been killed by this God in the Bible. So Kant would look at this Bible and say, you know what, I'm not sure that God in that form and structure actually exists in that way. Isn't it more likely that that's a projection of the people that wrote at that time, 3,000 years ago? Because that's what they thought. They were warrior types, they were vicious killers, so they thought God must be a vicious killer. So Kant was on the Christian side of the Bible. He followed the New Testament, and he read that there we should follow the God of love, who forgives, who's nonviolent, who's peaceful. He also read the bit that Christ came to reconcile man and God. And I think the Yazidis believed the same. It's in, one of the interesting things to discuss with Yazidis is, do they believe in a kind of Messiah figure who's going to come, like a Mithras figure? Do the Yazidis believe, and I think they do, that from time to time, great saints, sages, come to mankind. They have a list of names which are in their secret books. And that one is going to come and save them, you know. Um... I think they quite like Christ. I think they, they have him in their list of great sages. They like Muhammad, but, you know, not all his followers, because they're a bit fanatical. What Muhammad was trying to do, fine, but what he actually accomplished, mm, B minus. It'd be interesting to discuss this point. If Kant, you see, Kant believed in critical reason. Everything should be subjected to analysis, to logic, to study. And research. He was a true academic, uh, as I hope I am. I, I was trained by Kantian philosophers when I was in my you know, first philosophical um, years. So he said, maybe there's, confronted with all these things, like let's say I gave Kant an exercise, I gave him a year to study the entire periodic table, all 168 boxes, and I I tell them, you can't come out of the wrong until you've decided which is true. Right. Kant would, at the end of the year, come out and say, I can't do that, Thomas, because they've all got bits of truth in. You know, um, and all have got some silly bits, too. So the human mind, said Kant, is limited. It can't rationally work out what is ultimately true. You know, like, is the Yazidi story true or is the biblical story true? Is, is God good, you know, the slayer, God the slayer? Or is, is the angel that's trying to look after the world in spite of God the slayer, is he good? You know, like, who's right here? Well, Kant would say we can't know with reason. Therefore, and there's some immortal stuff Kant wrote away, you have to read him properly to find these bits. He said, therefore you have to take a leap of faith. When reason fails, as it does in the end, you have to take a leap of the heart. And then you will know what is the right answer from feeling the righteousness of, of the thing. You have to take a leap into love, essentially. So Kant would say, you know, I love them all. They're all partly right. Let's create, let's see life as a work of art in which they're all like a form of music. I was thinking earlier about music. Um, imagine the periodic table was like you had an organ, like an electronic organ, and each note you press is a different tone, and then you can literally make music playing the organ of all these pieces. I mean, that'd be cool. Uh, I'd love to make that. It could be done. And I think Kant would be with that because he believed in beauty, he believed in life. 
although he never married and uh, didn't have time for all that stuff, he, he was on the side of life. And, um, you know, he believed that Christ had come to save the world, not destroy it. Uh, and he also believed very much in peace, because his work um, as a peace philosopher was seminal in, in inspiring me to do my work as a peace philosopher. Um, he was one of the first philosophers to, to call for an, a unity of all different nations in Europe to begin with. So the European Union essentially was Kant's idea, which is why I support it. And also the United Nations has grown out of Kant's vision of... He said there should be a pact of perpetual peace between different nations, which I support the United Nations and the European Union and the Commonwealth and, and the Francophonie and all these other kind of... Let's, let's live together, make music instead of war. And um, so I think there is a link here between, between Kant and the Yazidis. They're both on the side of the angels. It's just... I'm not sure Kant had ever heard of the Yazidis. Um, because it's it's quite a new thing, um, you know. But he was, by the way, he was partly Scottish descended. Uh, interesting enough, Kant had ancestors who were Scottish, so and they were quite clever philosophers. So you know, that tradition is important, and and maybe all flourish in a world of peace. I would say, that's where we end with those two. I think. Okay, is that enough? Yes, it's so enough. That's, that's Thank enough to much. think on this week, isn't it? Sure. And let's hope the Philosophy Club, let's hope that we um, cast a little light by doing these talks and looking at these relationships. Think of it like, um, like a sonne lumiere. I'd love to see this product table like yes. lighting up <laughs> a sky with rays connecting them and then a voiceover explaining the links. So, okay. Thank you. Merci bien. I think we'll finish there, and um, we'll see you see you next time.